Welcome to Backpacker Radio, presented by the Trek, brought to you by OnX Backcountry. I'm your co-host, Zach Badger Davis, and sitting to my right today is... Hi, I'm Juliana Chauncey, a.k.a. Chauncey. Question of the day. You have one hour to spend $10,000 in one store. What store are you choosing? Um, so I Is this gonna... your question, or is this Elise? This is me. And I texted it to you, and you said, I really like this one. Okay. And then at least You would have thought that I would have put any amount of thought into it, but you'll be yeah, sorely you, disappointed. You were the one that selected it out of the options I sent. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so the dad brain firing in all directions today. I'm going to go with West Elm, and I don't think I'll need the full hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll so pick a nice couch. Is West Elm, I'll... yeah, is West Elm like a Pier 1 type store? I don't know if I've ever been. It's like a fancy schmancy furniture store in Cherry Creek. Uh -huh. um, and like other places, it's not just in Denver. But, yeah. Um, it's like super expensive. Like a couch is like $3,000. Um, mm. But man, are they comfortable. Uh, you know what I've learned is three thousand dollars for a couch isn't even like outrageously expensive. No, it's like high end, but like standard high end pricing, which I hate. Yeah. But if they gave me ten thousand for one store, I'd feel a lot less guilt about spending that much money on furniture. Yeah, Jen and I got th this is like our first big co purchase was like a leather couch together. We went to American Family furniture yeah warehouse. warehouse. Yeah, that's the one. Got literally like the one on sale and then haggled it down and then financed it. <laughs> and it was like the biggest purchase that we had made at that point in our relationship. So yeah, couches are a big deal. Yeah. That's a great choice. Um, my answer is a big time cop out. And I'm glad I thought of this because my backup option was dumb. Amazon. That doesn't count. It's a store. It says in one store. You, you can't go in Amazon. Well, first of all, the pandemic is still raging right now, so I don't feel comfortable going in any store, so I'm going to Amazon. You're sitting in a bank. <laughs> first of all, this is the Trek headquarters. How dare you? <laughs> Secondly, uh, that's a loophole and I don't like it. <laughs> well, so my b backup answer was like, I'm going to go somewhere where I'm spending a lot of money anyways, and that's like groceries. Yeah, go to Costco. Oh, I was going to say, Jesus Ooh, Christ. <laughs> that's an email. <laughs> uh, I was going to say Whole Foods, but that's such a boring ass answer. Yeah, I mean, food goes bad. Not, I have a chest freezer. I could get a bunch of frozen shit. I get like you would fit ten thousand dollars of Whole Foods food in a chest freezer, listen, and that like would be a the one pound store steak, you'd go to. like a Del Monaco steak or like a New York strip steak, is probably thirty bucks per pound. Why don't you go to like a butcher and like just get ten thousand dollars worth of like high? Because I want a little diversity in my life. I'm not just eating dry like meat. aged, you know. That well, type the, of thing. the whole conversation's moot because I'm going to Amazon. Well, you're not going to be in Amazon. I will be. Listen, th we are living in the virtual era. I'm going to put on my VR headset and shop in Amazon. Okay. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, reminders of any kind? Nope. Let's get right to our interview with none other than my good bud. She's a podcast co-host. She's a backpacker. She's a runner. She's a van lifer. She's a philosopher. I'm going to go with philosophers, your primary thing. She's Nicole Antoinette. Thank you so much for joining us. This is long overdue. I'm really happy to have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Okay. So... I know that was kind of a convoluted intro, but let's say I meet you at a cocktail party or a, um, a fake cocktail party, I guess, would probably the more, would be the start. more appropriate <laughs> setting. A hike. I, I meet you on a hike. What is, what's your Cliff's Notes introduction to somebody, your elevator pitch introduction? Oh, gosh. Cliff's Notes introduction to somebody. Um, you know, I don't know that I have one. I think it would depend on the setting and what it is that they asked. One of my least favorite questions is the what do you do yeah. question. I think mostly those of us who have this pieced together creative self-employment life, that can often be a... Um, I don't know, a stressful question. I feel like I'm someone whose uh, parents don't understand what they do, right? My mom's like, well, Nicole does something on the internet, <laughs> right? Which like, I guess, I guess that's, that's fair, that's true. Does she think you um, have an OnlyFans account? I know, right? Um, my mom doesn't know what that is, I don't think. Um, and I don't know that I'm gonna be the one to teach her. So <laughs> great segue, great. Um, yeah, I when so whenever someone asks me what do you do, my answer is always for work, for money, for fun, for mm. you know, and trying to understand like what it is that they're actually curious about. Um, but I, as you said, I host a podcast. I actually have no idea when this is coming out. So uh, probably in about ten days. Today's May okay, 15th. very soon. But, yeah. Yes. I host a podcast and I do a bunch of digital community stuff and retreats and gatherings and writing and all kinds of things. I have a terrible elevator pitch. I always have, <laughs> and I don't really care. I'm not someone who has um, really leaned into trying to have a good, here's everything you need to know about me in 20 seconds. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I mean, I can attest to the fact that your career has been an evolution. And I feel like your career has kind of evolved with what the internet is. Because when we first met, I think it's fair to classify us both as bloggers, which is kind of like a lost skill because people forgot how to read. Nobody's reading anything anymore. I shouldn't say that because you're still an active writer. Uh, I forgot how to write, therefore that's what I think. But um, yeah, you've grown into the podcasting space. You you do a lot of like in-person events. So can you talk a little bit about like, I guess I'll be more specific. What is it that pays the bills nowadays? What is it that pays the bills? Great question. Um, so my podcast is listener funded on Patreon. So that is the bulk of my income comes from Patreon. And so that's the podcast. That's all kinds of like digital gatherings. The last year, like for a lot of people has changed things for me. Um, In-person retreats and events and stuff were a big part of my business that obviously in 2020, poof, that <laughs> went away. So it was moving a lot of things online. But yeah, most of my income comes from Patreon, comes from kind of random one-off things. I'm hoping been hosting something this year called the Get Shit Done Club, which is basically like a really casual co-working group for people like me who do better when surrounded by others to do like frightening or like really unsexy self-care tasks. Like for whatever reason, I need to be surrounded by people to like cheer me on to make a doctor's appointment. I don't know what that says about me <laughs> as like an adult, but um, yeah, there were just a couple of opportunities that came up during this everyone's isolated inside time in the last year to host gatherings virtually to bring people together. And so that's been pretty cool, but I'm in a big, that's why I asked when this is coming out because I I'm in a really big transition phase with my work, with my work and with my life. Uh, May 1st was my 10 year soberversary. Congratulations. Which, oh, thank you. Um, was actually not as big of a deal as I thought it was gonna be. I thought it was gonna be this really hugely powerful milestone and wound up being a very boring and ordinary day, which was delightful actually, to realize that this thing that I used to think about and struggle with every single day is just not an issue for me anymore, which I'm really grateful for. But I realized something about hitting that 10 year mark made me feel like a lot of what I've been talking about or teaching or working on in the last almost decade feels like it's complete for me, yeah. which is both exciting and terrifying to make big changes. And yeah, I just feel like a lot of my projects are in sort of that tender, sweet wrap up or a transition phase, which is why this is like a particularly hard time. And I'm you know, probably not giving you good answers, but hard time to talk about what I do because I'm in what feels like a, what I'm calling a composting phase where like everything that I've done before is going to somehow be like the soil through which the new thing grows. I just don't really know what those new things are yet. So I potentially six months from now, I'd have a better answer for you. Yeah, but. I, I'm sure you'll figure it out and you've deserved some downtime, but I love that analogy. I'm not gonna let you get any further until you plug your podcast though. You mentioned my podcast. You didn't mention the name. Hmm. It's called Real Talk Radio and it's long form, honest conversations about literally everything, right? Like in the 200 plus episodes, if people want episodes on, I don't know, uh, marriage, body image, sex, money, work, like it's all over the place. It's been just a container in which honest conversations are held, which is a huge passion of mine, is talking about things without an agenda or without a right answer necessarily. And so The other thing you mentioned is your metamorphosis. And uh, I think one really interesting aspect of that is you recently archived all of your Instagram posts. Can you talk about that decision? Yeah, I, it's part of this composting phase, right? Where I just think sometimes we need a fresh start and it doesn't have to be super dramatic, but particularly with creating content of any kind online, the archives can be so deep and sometimes you want that there and sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. um, in 2015, I had been blogging for eight years so that my sort of like in, doing things on the internet started in 2007 with a personal blog that I never thought was going to turn into any sort of income. I had no idea that kind of digital entrepreneurship was a thing. I just really like telling honest stories about my life. So I started a blog, did that for eight years amongst other things. And one day deleted the entire thing and people were floored by that. And it just, for me, I felt like I was done with it. And sometimes I feel like the old thing needs to go away and then there needs to be a period of space in order for whatever the new thing is to come. And that's sort of how I felt about Instagram. And it was, yeah, it was around the, the 10 year soberversary time where I went in there, realized that you didn't have to delete your posts. You can archive things. So I still have them for me if I want to go back. And especially the thing that was, I was on the fence about is I have done daily my blogging from all the long distance hikes that I have been on. And I didn't want to lose all of that writing, but I still have it for me. Um, it just felt like 
what would happen if I archived this and not start it over because I'm still talking about a lot of similar things, but I don't know. I'm sure you can relate. Sometimes a clean slate feels good. And it was interesting, the reaction that I got from people. I got a lot of private messages of people who either wanted to do the same thing on Instagram or in another area of their life where like, I'm really craving some kind of change and haven't been able to give myself permission to do it. Like, I think there's something in this that I can't be the only one who wants to end a chapter and start a new chapter. Sure. This is probably, I don't know if this factored into your reason at all. It doesn't sound like it was one of the primary reasons, but like I listened to things that I said a year ago, let alone a decade ago. I was such a dumb baby boy. Like I just had terrible thoughts. I mean, like I still do, but uh, hopefully I'm not saying things that make me cringe at this exact moment that I totally understand the desire to just scrape things that you've put out into a public sphere. Cause especially originally when Instagram came out, I don't think anyone envisioned that it would become the thing that it is today and consumed like ubiquitous, ubiquitously. Um, like I thought I was posting it for the 15 people in my friend group. And so I would say, you know, things that I would not say otherwise today, did that factor into your decision to scrape things? Not really. I think it's more, I'm really conscious of not wanting to get stuck in what I think of as an identity cage where, you know, people only think of you as this thing and this thing. And so then that becomes the only things that you can talk about because that's where the social validation is. Like when I, when I was mentioning in 2015, that was sort of my last big composting phase of deleting the blog and kind of moving in a new direction. Um, I, so some context, I quit drinking and started running on the same day after never being even remotely athletic. Like I'm the one who would, you know, fake sick and we had to run the mile in high school or how can I hide from this? Where's my doctor's note? You know, really the least sporty kid, the most indoor person you've ever met. And when I quit drinking, I realized that it was such a big thing to take out of my life that you can't just take some, maybe you can, I can't just take something huge out and not replace it with something else. Otherwise it's just, just like gaping hole. And then I don't know what to do. And so I thought I'm going to run a half marathon and I literally couldn't run for like two minutes. So I don't know where in my head, I thought this was a good idea, but it really worked. It was like my way out of the hole. It was like a switching of obsessions for me and running was hugely transformative. It was the first thing that I ever started and was terrible at and didn't quit. And I had a real history of if I start something and I'm not good at it, then I'll just give up. And that was the first time that I didn't do that. And it really changed my life. And I ran really seriously for four years, loved it. And around my four year soberversary, I got to the point where I was not enjoying running. I was really fit. It was not an injury thing, but I just was kind of miserable. And I realized it's because I was afraid that if I stopped running, I would start drinking again. Mm. And that didn't feel like doing it for the right reasons. It was this really fearful. I didn't trust myself. And so I said, let me just take like a little break from this. I thought it was going to be a couple of weeks. I haven't run seriously since 2015. So spoiler alert, it was more than a couple of weeks. Um, but it was a real composting phase for me of, I had built kind of an identity as a runner. Like people knew me as like, oh, Nicole, the person who went from like zero to running marathons and a running coach and I, um, used to have a pro an online program where we helped other beginning runners. Like it was a huge part of my business and my life. And when I fell out of love with running and stopped doing it, I don't know. I can't really fake things. If I'm not excited about something anymore, I kind of just need to be done with it. And so I wasn't running. So I didn't really want to talk about it. I didn't really want to write about it. I didn't really want to host a group of beginning runners. And I sat there and I was like, oh shit, I've sort of built my livelihood and my life around a part of my identity that has boxed me in. What if my identity changes? Right. And I was vegan at the time and I'm not anymore. And I just felt like I have to stay stuck. I have to keep running. I have to stay vegan. I have to do, you know, these things because that's what people expect of me. And when I deleted that blog and kind of wrapped up that business and took a little bit of a hiatus that the podcast and other things wound up being built out of, the big lesson for me is that I actually don't like monetizing my passions. I think that's sort of the dream for a lot of people. And maybe that does work for others, but I realized that I don't ever want my livelihood to be dependent on my hobbies or um, whether I live in a van or not, or whether I eat a certain way or not, or whether I'm married or not. And so kind of, this is a long answer to a question, but with Instagram, I'm always really conscious of, I don't want to just be a capital H hiker or a, this kind of, and there's nothing wrong with any of these things, but for me, it starts to feel like a trap and it starts to feel like I can't grow or change at all. And so part of wanting to archive things was like, okay, I feel done talking about some of this stuff. Let's move on. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I guess my question with that is, I know you're between things from like a money-making standpoint right now. Um, 
how do you pursue what the next thing is without using a passion as the igniter for that? Well, when I started Real Talk Radio, the impetus was I really value and love honest conversations. That was the through line of everything that I had created, like different in-person meetups or retreats. I had, like I said, I've been a writer my whole life in some capacity. And really the through line was I like having honest conversations, whether that's me and one other person, whether that's me sharing an honest story and a piece of writing that other people resonate with, like that seemed to be the thing. And so it really was how can I create um, a project with an umbrella large enough that it's not topic specific. And that I think is why, I mean, I've been doing this podcast for six years. It definitely wouldn't have had that longevity if it was all the conversations have to be about money, right? Or all for me, like I, my interests change too much. And so if you like look at the arc, if someone were to go back through the archives and look at these, you know, 200 plus episodes, there is a period where there's a bunch of them about hiking or a bunch about running or a bunch about entrepreneurship or, you know, a bunch about, you know, questioning monogamy, like different things, like different phases in my life have had kind of different things, but the the bucket was big enough to hold it. Yeah. So that's part of what it is for me is that I just don't want to tie. I thought about this when I first got into long distance hiking too, because um, that's something that's quite socially validated on Instagram, right? That like does well, I guess, or performs well. And I was quite conscious about, and who knows if this will change in the future. This was just for me turning down different sort of like sponsorship type things or collaborations just because I didn't want to ruin this thing that it was like I finally had a great outside of work passion. Like mm. I didn't want to turn that thing into work because it just changes the enjoyment of it for me. Yeah, totally understood. So one of the things you mentioned in the phases of like, there's a lot about running and there's a lot about hiking. You mentioned questioning monogamy. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I, oof, where, where do I even start? <laughs> I don't do you know. have a more, do you have a more specific question? No. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, in 2018 ish. So I used to be married. I'm not anymore. And, um, it was a conversation that my now friend and former spouse and I had a lot of what is the structure of this relationship. And I just started thinking, I'm trying to put this into a nutshell for you, but I realized that monogamy was something that I never considered as a choice. Like I, that was sort of the way that I was raised is that's what you do. And that's the only legitimate type of romantic and sexual relationship. And um, anything else is lesser than, and, you know, very Disney princess fairy tale style stuff. And for a lot of reasons that didn't really work for me and I blamed myself for that. Like what's wrong with me that I'm not necessarily fitting into this like very specific type of relationship structure. And so, yeah, it was just like a real deep dive exploration. Thank goodness for the internet of hearing like, oh, actually there's so many different ways to do relationships and they're all completely valid. And the difference in defaulting into something because you think that it's the only option versus choosing it on purpose. That was a real game changer for me. Like I'm practicing monogamy with my current partner and it's a choice that we check in on like I would say every six weeks ish maybe there's a conversation about it and that had never happened to me before in previous relationships and so there was a period of time where I was really questioning that and you know what's going to happen to my marriage are we on the same page about this type of stuff and so it was really cool to get to interview either relationship experts or people who had been practicing polyamory for a really long time I find that having a podcast is a great secret weapon for making friends with cool people or being able to be really nosy about things <laughs> that are outside of your maybe like direct circle or purview so yeah it was just cool to start to have those conversations and what shifted for me wasn't necessarily the relationship structure that I have it was more the opening my eyes to this is a choice and what does it look like to choose it instead of to like default into it and what would it look like to have a relationship where you're frequently having the conversations of like oh I find this other person attractive let's talk about that instead of that being like the biggest taboo ever huh. you sound very self-aware is that something that like you've always <laughs> been <laughs> been I'm, like, that way? Or, like is that something that like took practice to get to but it just sounds like you're very like aware of how you are and like what you need and all those different things that feels like a very true observation yes <laughs> i think it's a little bit of a chicken or an egg thing right like what causes someone to you know in their early to mid 20s say i'm going to start a personal blog and like talk about my feelings right and like I think it's either you do that because you want to process in that way. And then by processing in that way, you get 
more and more self-aware. So I think it's just been this like constant positive feedback loop of because this is a large part of my livelihood has been self-awareness. And like a lot of my work centers around self-trust. I, um, another part of my income, you know, Zach, you mentioned earlier, I create quarterly reflection workbooks um, that I sell in kind of a pay what you want format that basically started as every three months, I make one for myself and I have for years, just like a series of reflection questions. I'm really big into having honest conversations with yourself. Like, I think that we would probably all acknowledge that having honest conversations are a key part of really strong relationships. We think about that with our friends or with our partners or, you know, with our families. But I realized that I wasn't really considering if I want a strong relationship with myself, then I have to be having honest conversations just between me and me. And like, what is the format in which to do that? For me, it's often writing and sort of journaling prompts. And so, yeah, for years, I was just creating those for myself and then realized, oh, maybe other people want these. I feel like a lot of my work has been, I'm doing this weird thing over here. Maybe someone else would want it and then making it available. And then it attracts the other people who are into that weird thing. So yeah, I think it's, I think self-awareness for some people maybe comes more naturally, but I also think like anything else, it's a skill that you can build. The more that you are willing to tell yourself the truth, I think that that helps. I don't know if I've ever asked you this. Do you meditate at all? I have gone through phases of trying, you know, all of the apps and, you know, putting together little meditation streaks, but not consistently, no. Mm. I know either like directly or like I, I'm a big fan of Tim Ferriss's podcast, but a lot of people find like their in, introspection through meditation, which I was, I was just curious to see if that was one of the tools. For me, it's, the it's mostly through writing. Honestly, I feel like it's writing mm -hmm. is my, not that obviously writing and meditation are not the same, but that's the way I like process everything. Yeah. So, okay. I want to talk about the transition from you as a runner to a backpacker. Let's get to sure. the origin story of Nicole, the backpacker. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned not having been an athletic kid at all. I was also not an outdoorsy kid. I grew up in Manhattan and in London. My parents, oof, I feel like the most outdoorsy thing my parents have ever done is eat dinner on like the patio at a nice restaurant under a heat lamp, maybe. Right. Like that, that is the extent of the outdoorsing that was in my life. So very unlikely person to have gotten into this type of stuff. But I mentioned that I stopped running in 2015 and was really grappling with you know, what do I do next? Running doesn't really feel like the thing. And I found that while I appreciated taking the break from running, because it really made me feel a lot more secure in my sobriety of realizing, oh, I don't need this crutch. Like I'm actually good. I missed the physical challenge of running. I liked the progressive nature of, you know, on day one, you can do this, but on day 60, you can do this other thing that's like so much bigger. And I really missed that. And Actually, so I felt like there was this hole in my life that I was looking for the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I had recently moved to Oregon. I was living in LA before that. And I moved to Bend, Oregon with um, my former spouse. And it's it's quite outdoorsy here, right? Like pretty near the PCT. I did not know that the PCT was a thing. I mean, obviously I knew you, right? So I knew that there were these like crazy people who did these long things in the woods, but it was, I was always like, that is not for me. Like, I don't understand why anyone would want to do that. That's just like, I. I don't want to like dig a hole and poop in it. That's no, that was not for me. Um, and you know, I, it was just the right thing at the right time. What actually happened was the winter of 2015 into 2016, I had read a bunch of different adventure books on Amazon or like on my Kindle. And you know how it'll say, if you liked this book, you'll probably also like this book. And it recommended to me, um, carrot Quinn's through hiking will break your heart. And I read that and I was like, Oh, okay, this is something that I want to do. And I think it was just the right thing at the right time. I was craving a new challenge. I was craving something that I didn't know anything about that could be like that. I love that deep dive immersive experience. Like when you find a new obsession and you're like staying up late on the blogs, like researching all the things, listening to the podcast. Like I really like that idea of, and just like that feeling of getting super into a new thing. And that's what it was. And I said, oh my gosh, this is like actually the PCT is pretty near my house. Maybe this is a thing I could try. And I think the different for me is that um, I was like, oh, here's a woman in her 30s who didn't have experience who got into it. And that was me. I was in my 30s. And I had never, I mean, I had never gone camping. I had never slept outside a night in my life. And so that level of beginner status felt it felt too intimidating. It felt like this is a world that's not for me. And so sometimes it just does take one other person that shares like an aspect of your identity. And you're like, oh, they didn't die. Maybe I could do this and also not die. And that's sort of where the idea came from. And I decided to hike just the Oregon section. 
um, at first, which I say just to me, that felt like, I mean, I had never gone camping. I was like, I'm going to go alone and do this 460 mile thing like that. I have no gear for, I have never done in my life, but, um, I am a really big fan, as I mentioned before, of the like, how I can't run at all. Let me run a half marathon. I like choosing goals that are so big or at least so big to you that you almost have to become a different, like a better version of yourself in order to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Like it's less about the goal than it is like who you have to become through having tried it. That's right. really attractive to me. Well said. Um, quick aside before we get to the next question, are you hearing the notifications when the email? No, okay. No, I so think that's just our pain, okay. personal pain. So then I think we'll, we will use your audio track because we're getting a loud like notification every time Trance gets an email. So uh, if you're not hearing that, then we will definitely use your version. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not hearing it. Okay, perfect. Um, so, okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I have a terrible memory that is well documented. But if memory serves when you finish that organ section, I think you were dealing with a lot of pain, foot pain, oh my God. especially. Yeah. And I could sense that uh, maybe your love for backpacking wasn't the strongest at the end of the Oregon experience. And then within a matter of, I don't know, weeks, you're like, okay, I'm planning to through hike the PCT now. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I think this is sort of an interesting thing to talk about. I think that one of the struggles that I had with getting into backpacking from like such a complete beginner, once I decided to do the Oregon section, I went car camping once for one night and backpacking once for two nights, both in the like four weeks before I left for that trip that I was like, I should probably try this. Right. I like got some gear. I should learn how to pitch a tent. Like what is it like to sleep outside? Or in my case, lay awake outside being afraid of every single noise that you hear outside the tent, like convinced that something is going to eat your face in the night. That was me. And, um, I really didn't like it. Like I was pretty much miserable that entire 460 miles. Like there were great moments for sure, but I think that the the huge gap between the fantasy of the thing and the reality of the thing, I just wasn't prepared for that. Mm. And I don't know if it's because a lot of the accounts that I had read were highly romanticized or I don't know. I just wasn't prepared for what it is to be alone doing this hard thing that you're that's like outside of your skill level all day, every day. Um, and it was like physically one of the hardest things that I had ever done. And I was yeah, I was miserable. I had a ton of foot problems. Again, I think just from sort of the like zero to 60 nature, I like tried to train a little bit. But when you don't really know what you're training for, it's hard to prepare. And yeah, I finished when I got to Cascade Locks, I was like, I'm going to sell all of this gear. I fucking hate this. I'm never doing this again. Like burn this whole thing down. It was a great experiment. Like congrats, go me. I didn't die. But yeah, I, I think I cried every single day of that, yeah. of that hike. It took me, I think 26 days and I cried every single day. And there were, I mean, there were multiple factors, something else that was really hard for me. Um, and I have since worked through this a little bit, but I think it comes up for all of us. I had a lot of imposter syndrome, particularly because I started um, at the California, Oregon border in early August of 2016. And so I was like in the Nobo bubble. Hmm. And so I was on day one, two, three with these like horrific blisters, could barely set up my tent, like didn't know anything. And I'm surrounded by people who have been doing it for 1700 miles. And everyone was nice to me for sure, but there was, it was so lonely was almost lonelier than being alone mm -hmm. because I felt like they all had like this really strong camaraderie and were like tough in a way that seemed like almost mythical to me at that point. And so it was an interesting social experiment of like being almost like side by side realities of doing this thing. And I just felt like so much imposter syndrome every single day um, of that hike. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of the point where people are at their strongest too. You think that you just get stronger as you go, but I feel like this is very anecdotal. People are starting to break down toward the very end. Maybe they're pushing themselves a little bit too much, but the end is not the strongest. It's like right in that two thirds mark is where people are really hitting their stride. So I can understand that. Um, so you finish the hike, you hate it. You want to burn your gear. How long is it before you're planning your next backpacking trip? So... How long was it? Let's see. So I finished, that was the end of August of 2016. And then I did the Arizona Trail Sobo the following year. 
it wasn't that long, honestly. It was a couple of months. I think <laughs> it was the kind of thing where like enough time goes by that you sort of forget that it's the worst. This is how marathons were for me. Um, friends who have children say this is how childbirth is for them. Yeah. Like you just, you're looking at all the pretty pictures. I think part of it for me was that I felt like I had unfinished business with this thing. That all of the reasons that I thought that I would love it, like I love the simplicity of all you have to do is walk from point A to point B and not die. Like there's something very attractive to me. Like I feel like my off trial life can be really chaotic and you know, there's just so many things and so many distractions and so much attention and the simplicity of literally just one foot in front of the other keep going was so attractive to me. And I felt like, well, I had such a terrible time and I did so many things wrong and I've learned a lot maybe it would be better the next time. And so part of it was, you know, the pain in my feet had faded. So I'm like, well, I, I just felt like there were just, it, there were a lot of problems that I could solve and hopefully give myself a better experience. So maybe that was naive. I have since obviously come to love long distance hiking. I think otherwise I wouldn't be on this podcast. So um, it worked, I guess, but I just felt like I had unfinished business with this thing and I wanted to go, I told myself I was gonna go on one more hike and then that was going to be it. Like, let me just do one more and see how it goes. Just one more and quick 800 mile hike. Just one more quick 800 mile hike. Well, what <laughs> happened, I actually was supposed to section hike Washington. That was going to be my next one. But um, one of my best friends is a professional track and field runner, like a professional track athlete. And she got a spot on the 2017 um like world championship, like the U S team for world championships, which was incredible. And it was in London. Um, and I decided to fly over to support her, right. And to go to that. And it was the same time that I was going to like, going to do the Washington section. And so I thought, eh, once in a lifetime opportunity to go to this track meet, like with my best friend in London, where I hadn't been since, you know, I used to live there when I was a kid. And so I chose that and I'm like, okay, well I'm narrowing down my options for a hike. I was looking at something that was going to start in September. And so I was on the fence between like, what are good fall hikes? I was looking at the Superior Hiking Trail and I was curious about the Arizona Trail, mostly because I didn't know much about it and because it seemed really hard. And so I emailed the someone at the AZTA and was basically like, <laughs> how hard is this? I mean, like that wasn't my exact question. I should, honestly, I should pull up the email because the email they sent me back was very much like a cover your ass response. Like it, the like TLDR of that email was don't do this. You're going to die. Uh -huh. Like, I think, I think they were, you know, you have to be so experienced and the water carries are so long. And it's, you know, I think the Arizona trail has gotten quite a bit more popular in the years since then. Um, and particularly Novo, but they were like, there's going to be no one else out there. You know, it's going to, you know, such and such a thing. And I read that and I'm very much the person of like, don't tell me I can't do this. Right. And so I read that email and I was like, I'm going to do this. And so I booked a one way plane ticket and was like, Oh, I guess I'm hiking this trail now about which I know nothing just because I'm like stubborn with their probably very helpful email that I took as like a personal slight. I was like, you don't know me, which I had, I had done the Oregon section of the PCT, which like as far as long distance hiking goes, not easy. Obviously I was miserable, but easy comparatively. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did not know what I was getting myself into. I, the main reason that I wanted to do that hike was because I didn't think that I could do that hike. Yeah. Like I was fully prepared to fail like every single step along the way. Yeah. And you didn't. And uh, presumably you enjoyed it much more than the Oregon section because you're still backpacking today. So I'm curious, what are what were some of your big, I guess, if you could translate your advice between what you did wrong on the Oregon section versus what you did right, either on the Arizona Trail or just like uh, tips that you've picked up in the years since. What are the what are the things that made you start to enjoy backpacking? What are the things that start to make me enjoy backpacking? Um, having more realistic expectations, I think, is the biggest one. I think that it's really easy to follow along with someone's hike on Instagram or on their blog and see a lot of like pretty summit view pictures and think that it's all that. Logically, I knew that it wasn't, but I, the first time around, I just was not prepared for doing this thing for 12 plus hours a day every single day. I just wasn't prepared for that. So I think I went in to subsequent, I've gone into subsequent hiking with much more realistic expectations of a lot of the time it's going to suck. And maybe that's just me. Maybe there is some magical unicorn hiker out there that is like blissed out every single moment <laughs> of a hike. That is possible. Of I course. Think that's fireball. <laughs> yeah. If then, you know, send me an email, tell me all of your secrets. <laughs> uh, I felt very much like 
backpacking was a thing that I loved 2% more than I hated it. And that was enough to keep me out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also, I, I love type two fun. Like I, I, I sort of, the, the reasons for being out there, I was like, what if I didn't have to be blissed out every moment of the day for this to be worth it? Mm -hmm. And I haven't found, you mentioned before about meditation. Like I haven't found anything that compares to having to like sort of walk with yourself, sit with yourself for that many hours a day, every single day, especially on the Arizona trail. So when I went, I mentioned, I went Sobo, I met two other through hikers, one for a half a day we overlapped and another one for a day and a half. And other than that, I was alone. Hmm. I camped alone every single night. I, the longest stretch I went without seeing any other humans, like not just hikers, like any other humans was almost five and a half days, hmm. which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but up until that point, I've lived in really big cities. I'm quite an extrovert. I very much need people to listen to my nonsense. <laughs> and here I am for like five days feeling like the zombie apocalypse has happened and like I'm the only one out there. So it was a really interesting experience just in like being with myself more and learning to be a better friend to myself. That's been one of the biggest things that I have gotten out of backpacking for sure. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're from New York City and then moved to L.A. and now you're doing like uh, New York, L uh, London, L.A., San Francisco and then Bend. All so the, very big all cities the small until towns. Bend. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. Aside from shifting your expectations for what a backpacking trip was, are there any more like concrete things that you did in terms of like foot care or pacing or this, that or the other that you changed to help you enjoy the experience? I still battle the foot stuff. Honestly, that feels like it is not as bad. It's not as bad as it was the first year. I think that was just like a my feet were a little like tender, delicate, like not used to this. Like, I think it was just a breaking in period. I've tried a bunch of different types of shoes. I've tried different socks, anything that is like Googleable for what to do if you have like foot pain or a lot of blisters, I guarantee you I have tried it <laughs> at this point. Um, it's better than it was. I realized I, I think I just sweat a lot. Like I sweat through my shoes. I don't know if that happens to either of you, but like I if you look down my at my everything. shoes, yeah. yeah. Like, so I think maybe that is like a contributing factor to the blisters. Um, things that I did differently in a more concrete way were a lot more training, like mm -hmm. physically a lot more training and like long hikes with a pack on. Because I think what I was trying to do beforehand was like, I'll just walk a bunch or maybe run a little bit. And I found that the best, this sounds stupid, but like the best way to train for backpacking is backpacking. And so as much as I could, it was like, okay, put the heavy pack on, even if it's just for like a short walk, getting used to having the weight on my back, that was really helpful. So doing more physical training. Um, I just want to, yeah, I just want to emphasize that point. Cause I don't, I think a lot of people do take that for granted that the cross training thing will prepare you for backpacking and it, it, it's help. It's helpful. It's better than doing nothing, but backpacking really is the best thing that you can be doing by leaps and bounds relative to running or any other option. Yeah. And obviously that's not always accessible depending upon like sure. what pe where people live or what their schedule is. But for me, you know, I was living in Bend at the time. There's very easy access to trails of all kinds. Yeah. And, you know, I was finding, even if it's like, you know, going out for an hour or something, just like putting the pack on and trying to acclimate to that beforehand was really useful for me. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's probably the number one thing was training more, like I said, changing the expectations. Otherwise, like a lot of my gear stayed the same. I think, I think some of this too, like sometimes I wish I'm like, here's the five step thing that I did to like make it suck less. But I think it's sort of the experience of doing something, you learn what does and doesn't work for you. Yeah. I got, you know, when I went out on the AZT, I at least knew how to use all my gear, which wasn't true the first time around. And so like familiarity with something gave me more confidence because I didn't feel like I was as much of a beginner because I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I think that that was really useful too, was just you learn how to do the thing by doing the thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point also because like I get a lot of newbie friends asking me for gear advice and I'll tell them the things that I use and love and then they'll get out there like the pack fucking sucked or this, that or the other fucking sucked. Like it's a very uh, not one thing is going to work for every person. You have to actually go out and do the miles to figure that out. So yeah, I think it's like a cute thing to say, like hike your own hike, right? Like obviously that gets said a lot, but I still wasn't internalizing that until like year two or three of backpacking. Like I really was still measuring myself to what I thought sort of the standard was, you know, you have to hike these really big miles in order to be a real hiker, right? I'm putting that in like very big air quotes, but there were a lot of things 
that I thought that I had to do in order to be considered like legit in this activity or sport or whatever we want to call it. And none of that's true. Like the only thing that you need to do to be a backpacker is to go backpacking. Like mm -hmm. it, you don't have to go for out for three months. You can go for one night. Like that still counts. Like I really kind of scaled back what the definition was of like what it meant to be doing this thing. You know, you don't have to hike 30 mile days. You don't have to, there's just like a lot of stuff. You don't have to only eat ramen. Like there's, there's sort of this, I think like through hiker avatar out there that I felt like I have to measure up to that. And once I let go of that and actually was like, why don't I just do it my way and do what I want to do? That sounds kind of like a woo woo, but it helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm picturing like Forrest Gump running and breaking out of his braces as a kid, <laughs> like you escaping the uh, imposter syndrome, I guess, is the way that you described it. So did that happen on the Arizona Trail? I think so. I mean, the Arizona Trail was different than anything else, any other hiking that I've ever done because I was so alone. Mm -hmm. And it really helped me. I have been pretty much the slowest hiker of every group that I've ever hiked with. And that's it's funny when I say that, my friends like always want to say, oh, no, 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 you're not, as if that's a bad thing. Like, that's just a neutral statement. Some people are faster than other people, right? And I'm not one of those people. And it was really liberating to not have anyone to compare myself to. Hmm. It was just like really cool to be on this trail where I would just, this, I would just stop when I want to stop. If I want to take a break, it's break time. It's not, oh, well, and, you know, I, so bode some of the PCT the next year and wound up, you know, having a really great trail family. Oh, we've all decided we're going to have lunch here. So then, you know, I really want to try to make it there for lunch. I want to try to make it to that campsite. And there's pros and cons to all of that, of course, because it's great to have friends. But I really loved that I could just do literally whatever I wanted. So, yeah, I think that that was I gained a lot of confidence for sure on that trail. I feel like I'm pretty similar to some of the things you're describing in terms of like at night thinking that any sound is going to come eat your face off in your tent and like being a slow hiker, things like that. But one thing that's different for me is, you know, I don't like to hike alone. I like to hike with other people. I like the social aspect of it. And that like, especially camping near other people gives me the peace of mind that something's not going to eat my face off in the night. So how, like for me, it's fascinating that you have those feelings of like being afraid in your tent at night, but then also like, do the Arizona trail southbound by yourself. Um, how did you find like that balance of like not being too afraid and like just like being comfortable on your own? I think a lot of an experience depends on what you have to compare it to. So in 2016 on the Oregon section of the PCT, like I was around other people, but like I said, I didn't really feel like I belonged. I didn't really feel like I fit in. And so I think had I had a different first hike, right? Like had I had sort of the quintessential trail family experience, we're all in this together, we're doing this together. I don't know that I would have been as inclined to go out and do a hike by myself. But because that wasn't my experience, I was like, why don't I just swing the pendulum as far as I can to the other side and see what that is. My preferred hiking at this point is somewhere in the middle. And I sort of found that in like 2018, 2019, somewhere in the middle. And I think that's kind of what will happen going forward. But sometimes I think you overcorrect maybe is the answer, right? That I'm like, let me just do this totally alone and see what happens. I didn't realize that it was going to be that lonely, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that it wasn't as popular of a trail as the PCT, but I didn't realize it would actually be like multiple days, multiple times where I saw no other humans. That was a surprise for me. How did you cope with the loneliness? I did some crying, um, <laughs> really big fan of the cry hiking. Uh, I One of the things actually that really helped me, I mentioned before that I did microblogging on Instagram, having it like a creative project and feeling like, oh, when I get service, I can post this thing and get so many nice comments from other people. I think that social media rightfully so can get a really bad rap a lot of times. And it's really incredible to be able to support a stranger while they do this dream that they want to do. So finding support and like feeling like other people were cheering for me was really helpful. But I don't know that I did overcome it during the hike. A lot of it for me, I mentioned before, like trying to learn to be a better friend to myself has been about just letting myself feel how I feel. Like what if and try what if instead of trying to fix the loneliness, I just let myself be lonely. Easier said than done, for sure. But that was a lot of what that hike was was like, okay, you're lonely you can survive that. Right. And yeah, that was, it was, it was helpful for me to just be able to, the feelings exist and also I can keep hiking and to not, it's like, I didn't have to be in a good mood in order to hike. Right. I don't have to like want to do the thing in order to do it. And that was, 
useful, but I, there was no like epiphany moment where I'm like, oh God, now I'm never scared of my tent or I'm never lonely anymore. The being scared in the tent thing still happens. I think I just, you, you acclimate. Um, after a period of time, the exhaustion wins out over the anxiety for me. And so that's, that's helpful, right? When I've like hiked myself into the ground for so many days that I'm like, ah, there's a sound outside. Oh, well, it's probably going to be fine, you know, and you sort of learn the difference between, oh, that's a chipmunk. That's a deer. Oh, that feels that sounds bigger than a deer, you know. And so by the end, I felt like I was a lot more comfortable and confident being out there on my own. But I don't know, I don't know that these fears ever completely go away. I think we just get better at dealing with them. Yeah. Chance, would you describe yourself as an introvert or extrovert? Um, I had to take the personality test for the leadership program. Was this part of your recent doctor's appointment? No, that this they didn't make me do that. Thank Sorry. God. Um, I was a E something 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 for those four okay, letters, which the E part is extrovert. apparently extrovert, which is shocking. Um, I would have guessed introvert, which is I, the, so would I. The reason that I ask is because introvert likes to hike with people. Extrovert, big time extrovert. You said that you've sw since swung back to the middle, but like at least for a time, you really liked hiking alone. I wonder if there's anything to that. But you're not even an introvert, so maybe my whole yeah. theory is broken. I, and I took the test twice. And then I, I was reading through the answers. I should look up what the four letters were, but I was reading through like what it meant for me and it was spot on. Mm. And then it was like, we'll question like decisions. We'll question like, like if like it's like the right choice or like the right something or, um, and then I retook the test cause I wasn't sure the answers were right. And I got the same answers and I was like, well, I guess that verifies that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, but the sleeping in your tent alone thing, I would not be able to do that for 800 miles. I put headphones in and play music when I go to sleep. That way I can't hear any of the sounds and like whatever it is can just take me. Same thing oh, with yeah. the PCT. I'd hike at night and I'd put headphones in because it's like it's pitch black. I can't see if there's a mountain lion anyway. I'd rather just go out blissfully unaware. <laughs> that actually reminds I me of, of an interesting <laughs> aspect of your journey. I think this was the Oregon hike, right? Where you got to the start of the hike and realized that you had no like music or podcasts on your phone or something. Yeah. So I had I had gotten a new phone. Um, pretty soon before I started uh, that Oregon hike. And I thought that I had, you know, my contacts transferred, like everything else transferred. And I just never opened the like music apps. And I didn't have Spotify at the time. I didn't open the podcast. Like I didn't, I just assumed it had all transferred. And so I'm out there and I think it was, I don't know, halfway into day one. And I'm like, oh, I think it would be nice to listen to some music for like an hour or so. And I opened it and I'm like, oh, <laughs> there's nothing in this phone. This phone is completely empty. Okay, cool. You wanted to like go out in the woods and like be with yourself, care for what you wish for. And <laughs> yeah, I had nothing to listen to. And yeah, mostly just cried the whole time. It's great. <laughs> but so that's a problem that you could have rectified at some point on that hike. And if memory serves, you chose not to, right? Um, My... My husband at the time brought me my little iPod shuffle Okay. halfway through when he came to meet up with me, but it had whatever it already had on it, yeah. right? So it was like a playlist or right. something. And so, yeah. Here's and the nine I, songs that you get to listen to. For right, them. exactly. Like here, here's your nine song, you know, like theme songs that you can hear over and over again. But yeah, I, I have since... I, I do listen to things for mm -hmm. sure when I'm on track. I mean, not constantly, but I very much like, particularly in the afternoons, I, I love morning hiking. I love solo early morning hiking, just like quiet, but there will definitely hit a point at like 2 p.m. when it's really hot and I don't want to be doing it anymore when I need the pump up playlist or I need, you know, to like lose myself in an audiobook. I listened, this is so funny, I listened to the Twilight audiobooks <laughs> on trail like a lot. Um, <laughs> It was an audiobook series that I first got into when I was when I started running, because again, running was so hard. I mean, I couldn't do it. It was so so hard, and so I was I would bribe myself. I'm like, let's get some really trashy fiction that you're only allowed to listen to when you're running, mm. like something that's like whether it's good or bad, it's really engaging. Yeah. And so it would sort of trick me into wanting to go for the run because I'm like, oh my god, what's happening to Bella? You know. And so I got really into it, and then it's become my emotional comfort food. So when things are really bad on trail, like if, when I'm listening to the Twilight audiobook, like you know, shit is not going. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm hiking, and I'm like, if Bella can become a vampire, I can hike this hike, right? Like I get really. <laughs> essential about it. Um, it's funny, Chubbs, when you were mentioning the putting the headphones in, you know, so whatever it is just eats you. I remember a night on the Arizona Trail where I had seen like m signs of mountain lion activity in the, you know, couple of miles before stopping, before camp, right? I'm like, oh, maybe a footprint, maybe mountain lion poop. I think that's what that is. I didn't really know enough, but I thought so. I'm like, eh, hopefully it's fine to camp here. I camped in a place that felt fine. And I 
have a lot of insomnia issues off trail and sleep even worse on trail. So I was just kind of awake. And all of a sudden, this kind of like shining thing caught my eyes, right? And I'm in my little tent and I peek out at the mesh and I just see these two little like beams of light coming at me. And I think, this is definitely a mountain lion. It's in mountain lion's eyes. It's there. It's in the bush. It's looking to me. I'm going to die. And so I start, I like, I feel like, you know, the feeling where your mouth like tastes like metal, right? The like adrenaline, the thing that's pumping. I'm like physically shaking. And I'm like, okay, don't make noise. I'm like, it doesn't matter. It already knows that I'm here, right? I like went through this whole thing in my head. I'm like about to start crying. I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. I lay there totally still. I try clapping. Nothing happens, right? The beams of light are still there, still there. I'm terrified, right? Turns out it's the moon coming <laughs> through the trees in this like exactly perfect as time went on and the moon like moved in the sky or something, the beams of light moved, but it was one of the most terrified that I've ever been. <laughs> and then I'm just awake all night, hysterically laughing. Like it's so funny the way that our brains work sometimes yeah. that I'm, th I'm thinking this is it. I have no cell service here. Like no one's going to call my people, tell them that I love them. Like I'm going out tonight. It's going to happen. Turns out it's just like the moon. And I'm like, <laughs> Those are the types of things where, I don't know, I think you just get more comfortable over time. Yeah. yeah. We're, so we're, after you got a good chuckle out of it, were you able to fall asleep easily? Because my mountain lion incident, the, the I think the commonality is the spike of adrenaline. And then once you come down off that adrenaline, I collapsed. Like, I don't think I ever slept harder in my life or fell asleep easier than that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ex and that's, yeah, that's exactly what happened to me yeah. for sure. Yeah. So before we move on, just talking about no music on your iPhone and how you had a few songs, just to throw in a little 2018 callback, if you were able to put only one of the two following songs onto your phone, <laughs> would it be Ice Ice Baby or The Safety Dance? If you could only have one of them. And you like, do you have to have either of them? Because I would pick neither. <laughs> no, no, no. You have to have one, and it's the only song you can have. Okay, I think I will choose Ice Ice Baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if that is not the answer that you wanted. Yeah. That's the answer Zach wanted. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's just got a catchy riff. <laughs> Uh, okay, so before we get to the next hike, I don't I don't even know if this is an interesting subject, but let's follow this trail anyway. I'm curious if there's someone listening to this who considers himself an extrovert and is toying with the idea of attempting a hike solo. Because like even if you're going out to the AT, chances are you're not starting with somebody. Most people start by themselves and eventually fall into a group. But um, I'm curious to get your takeaway in terms of what you felt you gained as a self-described extrovert doing these two largely solo hikes. Hmm, that's a good question. I have always been someone who likes to get other people's opinions about stuff, right? And I don't mean everyone, the wider world, but like my close circle of people, what do you think about this? I'm thinking about this decision. Like I really like to talk everything to death, which won't come as a surprise to anyone who knows me or <laughs> maybe even anyone who's just listening to this for the first time. And when there's no one to do that with, you really do have to rely on yourself more. And I don't know that there's a way to kind of fake your way into that. That if I am surrounded with other by other people, I will talk to them. I will ask their opinions. So I think that was really helpful. I also think, I think a lot about what it is to be a, like a complete beginner at something the way that I was. And I certainly can't be the only person out there who went from like zero to, I wanna get into long distance hiking. And I always wonder what the right ratio is for someone of how much to learn versus how much to let it surprise you. Because I think going in with like actually no skills and like no idea what you're doing is dangerous. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there's like a little bit of a point of potentially over researching and not letting the experience surprise you. Yeah. And so I, I really liked on the AZT specifically, I felt like I had gained enough experience the previous year that I wasn't like, this is actually stupid, right? Like I didn't, I, I wasn't like, oh, I got dropped off and I don't think that I'm going to be able to survive, right? Like it wasn't that far outside of my skill level, but I think that doing things when you're a beginner, if you have other people there, at least for me, I'm really quick to default to their expertise or to give my power away, which if you're on like a guided trip and someone's like teaching you skills, like absolutely, yes, like learn from other people. But I, if there had been anyone else there, I would have kind of done whatever they said. This is how far we should go. This is where we should get water. Oh, no, this is the right way to do this. And I think it's great to learn. But when there was no one else there, you don't give your power away and you sort of have to say, 
I'm going to decide that I think this seems like a good campsite, right? Or I'm going to look at, like, you just have to be more present and more aware, at least for me, than I am when I'm in a group and can very easily default into the, like, loudest person or the most seemingly confident person. There's something nice about having to do that for yourself. Um, so, yeah, I would say those things, absolutely. But I don't, I don't know that I would want to do that solo of a hike again, but mm -hmm. it was a good experience. Like I'm, I'm, I definitely, I think that I'm a stronger person and a stronger hiker for having had that experience, but that's not to say that it was easy all the time. The other thing for me is I, this is something that I'm also working on, can very much tend to like get in the complaining cycle, like when things feel hard. And if there's no one else there to complain to, I don't complain. And so I actually find that I'm tougher, like mentally tougher when I hike alone. And something so my partner and I met on the PCT and it's something that we talk about a lot of, you know, we're going out to do the Colorado Trail this summer and we're going to try to hike separately a lot. Like we would hike together like all day, every day, you know, um, for a lot of our hiking. And I found that we would just get into these complaining loops where it was hard for me. And so then I would complain and then it would be hard for him. And then he would complain. And we realized that like, when you're alone and there's no one there to like bitch at, you just kind of get on with it. And so we are definitely going to be doing things. And I guess we could talk about this, like hiking with your partner or meeting your partner on trail, but we are definitely going to be doing things differently on upcoming hikes to try to like, let's spend most of the day separately as opposed to just hiking together all day. Yeah. Introducing your partner, I think is a very good segue for what is the logical next chapter, your PCT Sobo hike. Um, I know I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but um, I guess introduce that in the way that is most interesting to you. Cause so you did the Arizona trail, uh, I think is the typical progression for a lot of people. They, they end and you know, they, they focus on how exhausted they are and how draining it is. And then a, a couple minutes passes and you're planning the next hike. Um, so kind of take us to that point. Yeah, that's definitely what happened for me. I mean, I was also like watching you do that hike that year, right at that time. And I hadn't, I thought, so I had done, you know, this in 2016, I had done the Arizona trail and I was sort of looking for what felt like the Goldilocks of social experiences on trail that I had had this surrounded by a bunch of people didn't really feel like I fit in. And especially as a sober hiker, I think there can, this is a generalization, but there can be quite a party vibe, mm -hmm. um, particularly in sort of the like noble bubble. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that at all, but I didn't want to be all alone in the wilderness zombie apocalypse again. Right. So I'm like, <laughs> what would be something that would potentially be an in-between and going Sobo on the PCT seemed like it fit that, you know, it was obviously a trail that I was interested in. I had done a chunk of really wanted to do more, but my decision to attempt that hike in 2018 was really, really, really wanting to find people mm -hmm. that were into the same things that I was. I, one of the struggles for me, I certainly have friends who are athletic and who are sporty and do things. But at least at that time, I didn't really have any other close friends that were into this lifestyle or who had set up their self-employment career in a way where they could take big chunks of time off. That's it can be like quite an anomaly. And these were all decisions that I really made on purpose, choosing a career that I like lets me do this. And so that felt sort of lonely. I wanted to make other friends who were into this same thing that I was into. And I was hopeful and optimistic that the PCT would be the place to do that. So somebody listened to this who's curious about the social life of a southbound PCT hike. What does that look like? I wonder how much it's changed in the last couple of years. Yeah. Honestly, like I feel like this has just exploded. Especially mm -hmm. this year with like things looking very much up in the air in March and April and things looking much better today is middle of May. Yeah, I think this like, would be a very I mean, just good looking year. at how fast the permits went. And right. you know, so I I have no idea what you know what it is gonna be like now, but it was great. It was it felt like very much like the right amount of people. It felt like especially starting in Washington with so few resupply points that it was you were all kind of on the same schedule and the group was manageable enough that I didn't feel like, you know, there's not like competition for campsites and I'm not surrounded by so many people that it feels overwhelming. And I think that there's um, at least my understanding when I went into it was that it's a more aggressive of a start. You can't sort of ease into a Sobo hike on the PCT the same way that you can going Nobo just because the resupply points are further apart. Like you have to, I felt like I had to be prepared to do bigger miles. It was, I think a 200% of average snow year when I went. So mm -hmm. there was also quite a bit of snow, which I had no experience in before that. And uh, what was your start was, date? 
Uh, July 5th. July 5th. Okay. So I think like in an average snow year, the average start date is July 1st. So I, remind me, were you seeing a lot of snow at, on July 5th? Right there, no. There was a decent amount between Hearts Pass and the border, like on some like Rock Pass, like some of those. Saw someone got airlifted out. They like made a bad decision on the snow. That's always too. You're like a couple of days into a hike, and it's like, what have I gotten myself into? Yeah. That this person is right. Like there goes the helicopter. Oh God. Yeah. Um, but between Stahikin and Skykomish, it was pretty much snow the whole time. Oof. And yeah. I know, especially like through Glacier Peak Wilderness, that can get pretty technical in spots. Oh my God, it was, it was, it, I, I had no business being <laughs> out there with like, I mean, I had never hiked on snow before ever. Yeah. And so that definitely, if I could go back and give myself better advice, it would be, hey, maybe learn how to use your ice axe, right? Yeah. Like that was, that felt to me like a very fixable rookie mistake. I just assumed it wasn't gonna be that bad. And I, yeah, I was terrified. I was very grateful. Um, that I kind of got in with people to hike with. And I feel like they emotionally like carried me for mm -hmm. that, you know, that I owe them a huge <laughs> like debt of gratitude because I was well outside of my skill level. Yeah. Okay. So now walk us through this Sobo experience. You're doing the social southbound PCT hike thing. Um, yeah, obviously you've got plenty of miles under your belt from your previous hikes. How does this play into your mindset in terms of like what you're looking for versus what you're getting? I loved it until I didn't. And a huge part of that for me, I mentioned that I have some insomnia issues, some sleep problems. I really don't sleep well on trail. And I, again, if anyone has, I feel like I've tried all the tips, um, <laughs> but I found that in the previous two hikes that the hikes were short enough that not sleeping well, I could sort of muscle through it. And I think you and I talked like before I went out on this hike that the like foot, situation and the sleep situation, I knew those were my limiting factors. Like I, you know, was maybe sleeping three to five hours a night, maybe. And that's not enough. Yeah. And I can, I really have a high tolerance for not sleeping a lot because I'm really unfortunately used to it, but I hit a tipping point. You know, you do that for a month, it's one thing. And you do that for three months and it becomes like completely unsustainable. I was like a shell of a person. I just wasn't sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so going in, I was, I loved it. I had met these friends and made this like tight little trail family and was having the social experience that I had absolutely wanted for sure. But I wasn't sleeping well. And that started to become quite exhausting. And I was also, I had quite a high, I think you, you all have referred to it as high emotional base weight. <laughs> um, like I mentioned, 2018 was the time that I was really unsure what was going to happen to my marriage. And, you know, my former spouse and I had had a series of conversations before I left for the PCT of what do we think? What's going to happen here? And, you know, we'd been talking for maybe like seven months before that about mm, there's some things in this relationship that don't necessarily spell out longevity. Right. Mm. And so we decided essentially to like table the conversation and I was going to go and do the hike and something that was really challenging for me. And I'm always interested to talk to other people who they are in a partnership and they're the ones who hike in this regard and their partner doesn't, that it's a lot of emotional negotiation to leave someone at home for that long. Yeah. And he was, incredibly supportive in lots of different ways. And also his preference would have been for me to not do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there was always an element of, I think, and I, obviously I'm, I'm speculating, but I would imagine that he felt a little bit resentful, a little bit abandoned. And like, I always felt low key guilty. Hmm. Um, it's one thing to go out for a weekend, but like, it's a lot to be like, hey, I'm gonna go, you mail all my resupply packages and be my emotional support person. And as you know, the emotional roller coaster of long distance hiking, like you can be, it can be the worst day of your life, even though nothing has happened, right? You're just so afraid. And you know, that's the one time you get service to call them and you're having this really hard time and they're trying to manage all of the household things, like doing their job and regular life, and then also being your support person, and then also missing you. Yeah. And that's a lot. Um, trying to give so you a was, pep talk to stay on the trail when they don't want you to stay on trail. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, I think that that's true, you know, even for couples that do stay together, you know, it's not, we certainly didn't get divorced because of long distance hiking, but you know, it was this desire to have sort of different lives and different lifestyles really took a toll. And so I feel like in that regard, my emotional base weight was high. And also in the, 
it's one thing to be like, let's put down this hard relationship conversation for like a couple of days, but to be like, let's put this down for four months and I'm going to go hike this trail. It, it just proved to be too much. Mm-hmm. And so I did about 1600 miles and just got to the point of like exhaustion and needing to go home and like deal with some off trail stuff that I decided to quit. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that, because that is something that you and I have had private conversations about in the way that we define a failure and that like you announced it as a failure and people were trying to, you know, soften that blow a little bit. Can you just talk about the perception of falling short of the goal of completing a through hike? Yeah, quitting the PCT, again, I had been, you know, microblogging every single day. So there were definitely people who were following along, who were into it, whether they were friends, family, strangers on the internet. And really publicly quitting something is a wild experience that people have got all sorts of opinions about what you should or shouldn't do or yeah, or they're disappointed in you or they're not, or they're proud of you. It's just like a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. And when I decided to quit, I was very open about I'm quitting this thing for these reasons. And that, you know, I failed to do this through hike. And it was really interesting how people were the same way that people want to say, oh, no, no, you're not a slow hiker, as if being a slow hiker is a pejorative thing. Oh, no, no, you didn't fail. And they wanted to almost like rose colored glasses the story, right? Well, no, you just learned that, you know, and it's true, I did learn things, but I wasn't saying I'm a failure as a person because I didn't complete the PCT hike. But the truth is that like, I did fail to do something and why can't we let that be okay? It really made me think a lot about not just in hiking, but like, what is the larger conversation that we're having about quitting and about failure? And I was thinking about this at the same time, I, you know, I got off trail and pretty much got divorced pretty soon after. So it was like these two experiences of quitting, if we're going to call it that, right? Like quitting the trail, quitting your marriage. And it feels, it's like a big ego hit. Like, who am I that I can't stick with these things? Like Mm. we are told, or at least I was sort of raised in a way where longevity is the marker of success. Yeah. You know, you've been married for 50 years. You've been on this, you know, you knew you wanted to be in this career since you were three years old and, you know, you were this prodigy and you climbed the ranks or there's like something really sexy about the story of completion or about doing something for a really long period of time. And that can be awesome if that's the right fit. But I think that that's actually more rare than not. Mm -hmm. Like we change, you know, like you, your relationships change, your careers change, you want to quit stuff, you want to leave. It's kind of what we were talking about at the beginning about the composting. Something can be an incredible fit for you for a period of time, and then it's just not anymore. And if we don't let, if we don't give ourselves and each other permission to change, or to like make a different decision, or to like quit when you haven't slept in three months, and you like need to go home and deal with your life, like, I don't know, I've seen so many people that are really public about their through hikes and then they get off trail for whatever reason and then they just kind of like stop posting and they yeah. never really acknowledge that they quit. And I'm not here to tell someone else like wh- how to, you know, how to publicly process their things. That's completely up to them, but I do think that it's it was really empowering for me to be like I quit this thing. I set out to do this thing and failed to do it. Yeah. No, I I have to yeah. I, that's a great point. I think we need to normalize failure because you know, I not to, like you said, put rose colored glasses on it, but I think the the success is the fact that you gave it a shot. Like there's so many people that think about doing this their entire life and then never get off their couch because, because they're afraid of failing. I think, um, you know, not to do the thing that people were doing to you, but like there is an aspect of the fact that you got out there and you hiked 1600 miles. Like that is a wildly better experience than the people who are just tossing the idea around for their entire lives. So, um, yeah, I, I think failing is, is a good thing. Like you've, you've tried it, you grow from failure. I'm also curious to get your take because you're very particular in the way that you frame everything in your life or so it seems as your friend and you've chosen to accept this thing as a failed hike. I'm curious what value you get out of acknowledging it that way versus, you know, spinning it the way that the internet wanted to spin it. I think it comes back to just wanting to be honest with myself about what the experience is that I could have told myself like a very pretty story about, you know, here's, here's why it wasn't a failure. Here's the, but like, like you said, I don't know that we learn from that. It was a lot more helpful for me to say, wow, okay. 1600 miles was double the longest hike that I had ever done. Of course I was in uncharted territory. You know, I think it's, we never know how we're going to feel about a thing until we do the thing. I, I, I found this a lot with van life too. It's, 
again, there's like a fantasy or you can, what you think it's going to feel like, or you could be like really sure that something is for you and then you try it and maybe you love it or maybe it's not for you. And I think that there, at least for me, can be shame around that, especially if you told people, I'm going to do this thing. And then you find either that you don't like it, so you want to stop, or it's harder than you wanted it to be, and so you're going to quit. I, I just want there to be more space for that. And yeah, just like letting what's true be true. Like, I quit that hike. Okay. You know, and then I went out the next year and did 700 more miles of it, right? That I had big section that I hadn't done. I think I have like 300. There's 300 miles of the PCT that I haven't hiked, right? Like something in that. And it was really useful for me to, again, sort of really lean into this hike your own hike thing. I remember, so I quit in the Sierra at like probably the most, you know, I wound up, I quit so hard. I'm someone who, when I'm done with something, like I'm done, you know, I wound up quitting by way of taking like the last ferry of the season to VVR hmm. and hitching, like hiking four miles to like a different, to Mono Creek Hot Springs. It's like a, you know, other resort and like hitching a ride to Fresno. Like I was so done. I'm just like, get me out of these mountains. Like I want to be done. Um, but I quit in the Sierra. And so I had met a lot of JMT hikers at the time. And one when they would find out, you know, what I was doing, it was really interesting to watch how people kind of like shrunk themselves. Like, oh, I'm just doing the JMT. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's nothing like what you're doing. Oh, I'm only doing this. And I used to feel that way in running too. Oh, I'm just doing a 5K. You know, it's not a marathon. It's sort of this belief that something has to be huge or really hardcore or like, yeah, the most hardcore version of it in order for it to count as if anyone's counting, right? Mm -hmm. Like nobody's, who do we think is counting? I don't know. But it was just really interesting to watch um, the hierarchy of the JMT is incredible. Like that could be like a lifelong dream for someone. And just because you could technically hike longer than that many miles, I don't know. I, it like really was a, a, like a learning lesson for me of the ways that we make our own like dreams and accomplishments really small because there's someone out there that's doing it better. I thought about this a lot on the AZT it took me 44 days to hike that trail. And at the time, Anish's FKT was like the overall FKT. I think at that point it was like 19 days. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I got to day 19 and I'm looking at this map of how much of this trail that I had left, I was like, oh my God, like how, right? Like, like it, was, it took me more than twice as long. And I really had to reflect on, like, I think that it's worth getting the best out of yourself, even if you're never gonna be the best. Yeah. And it can be really, I don't know, like easy to put other people's like huge successes or big challenges like on a pedestal and not give yourself credit for the things that you're doing. And I don't even remember what your initial question was, but those are, <laughs> it doesn't those are things that I thought about a lot in the like <laughs> quitting experience yeah. um, and to not let other people define like what the experience has to be. Like I could have kept hiking, you know, like, yeah. yes, I was tired. Yes, I had things to do. But I think that had I pushed myself to finish the PCT, that I mean, it. I don't know that I ever would have hiked again. Sure, I think it's really interesting the the response you got with the rose colored glasses because, like, okay, so for my PCT hike, and I've talked about this on the podcast a couple of times, I ended up skipping past the Sierra because of the snow and the rivers, and then the goal was when I got to Canada, I'd go back down. We get to Canada, and it was like mid September. I was going to be the only person going back down. I felt like I was good on the trip. Like I want to go back down there when I'll actually appreciate it. And so I was like, cool. You know, you post the border photo, put up the YouTube video. And it was insane. Like the comments on the YouTube video was, and I don't really reply to comments much, not because like I don't read them, but I just think it's like a lot of time out of my day that I don't know. I don't like, I don't like being on it that much, um, but I read them. And it was like, people were getting into arguments about, well, you shouldn't post your border, border photo, you technically failed, like this and that, and you're not a through hiker, whatever. I never called myself a through hiker. But then they would get into these arguments with each other of, you know, no, it's not, you're such a jerk, this and that. And then like, well, technically it is. She set out to do the whole trail. She didn't do the whole trail. Technically that would be failing at a goal. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I actually do agree with you. Like in the grand scheme, like I set out to hike the whole trail. I did not hike the whole trail. Technically, I did fail at that goal. Who gives a shit? And it's just like, for me, it's like, that doesn't bother me. That does not bother me that it's not like, oh my God, I through hiked that year. 
I didn't call myself a through hiker until the end of 2019 when I finished the AT. But it was fascinating to me how much it affected other people, whether or not I had succeeded or I had failed. The fact that other people were so invested in either yes, she did or no, she didn't. And it's like, like it's, it's my hike. Like, who cares? Mm-hmm. You know, and like, I shouldn't have to feel like I need to go back and do these you know, other miles that I missed specifically so that I can call it a success. If I'm not going to enjoy it, I'd rather take the fail, go back in 2019 or 2020 like I did, hike the JMT separately, had an amazing time on that trip. And it's like, why shouldn't that be the case? You know, like I had such a better time with my hike in 2017, not pushing myself to go back by myself and do something I really truthfully knew I didn't want to do alone. And then going back in 2020 when the timing was right, when I could enjoy it, when I had someone there to have fun with. But the fact that on those comments, it was just such a back and forth of you're a failure. No, you're not. I mean, you'll remember when we started the podcast, we made the subtitle. Well, you had made the subtitle hosted by through through hikers, Zach Davis and Juliana Chauncey. And I was like, you should change that to long distance hikers. Um, But it's crazy how like how hard people will shove down your throat that you failed but also how much other people are like afraid to just call it a failure you know it's like no you can't call it that you can't call it that but it's like why not yeah it's i mean and what's happening in your comment section is a lot of the reason why we don't talk about quitting or failing things yeah right that it's i think that those types of experiences are really useful self-reflection of like why am i doing this like am i trying to perform the role of being a through hiker And I think I had to be in quitting that trail. I had to be really kind to myself about, I don't know. I think we all have this desire to belong and it meant something to me to be a PCT through hiker. And there was a little bit of a, like, not that to say I couldn't do it in the future, but like letting go of a dream or you see yourself in a certain way, or you want other people to see you in a certain way. And if for whatever reason that changes, there can be like grieving there too. Like, it sounds like you felt like totally chill about your decision. Like I had a lot of grief about mine. Like that wasn't, quitting was the right decision. And just because something is the right decision doesn't mean that it's the that it's easy to do. And something that that experience taught me, although I think I've been like learning this in every area of my life, just how much more messy and nuanced everything is. Like we want it to be like, you're a through hacker or you're not, right? You fit into this box or you don't. Like that. that's, there's something really appealing about that. And so few things really fit neatly into those boxes. It's true in relationships, friendships, work, like every, like everything's so messy, right? And letting that happen, the most meaningful thing for me, I got a couple of private messages after quitting that trail from people completely unrelated to hiking, someone who really wanted to quit their PhD program and hadn't because they were afraid of what their parents were gonna say, right? Or someone who had been in a romantic relationship that they knew wasn't the right thing for them and they were afraid to leave right and so and a couple messages like that of people who are like thank you for quitting out loud and that has really stuck with me not again we don't owe each other anything you are allowed to have be as private as you want but i do think that having more conversations about quitting is useful mm-hmm. yeah i think I, I think just the world we're in with the long distance hiking is people are so obsessed with the titles and it's like the titles shouldn't be more important than the experience like i'm not gonna alter my experience and like go do something that i don't really want to truly do just for the title of it and i think a lot of people have that trouble of letting go of you know oh i'm not gonna be a through hiker and it's like who gives a fuck do you have a good time yeah i'm also mm-hmm. curious were you insulated somewhat from like the long distance backpacking peanut gallery because like you had already established your own community prior to you even entering into the backpacking world people that were going to support you like you have a cult around you and because you're so you're you're so good at just being uh managing relationships and speaking honestly like you obviously come about it very honestly but it seemed to me that you weren't thrust into the normal like backpacking community because you had already developed your own support system That is exactly right. There was nothing in my comments that was like what was in Chance's comments, right? And um, not that people were thinking whatever they were thinking privately, right? But that I think for better or worse, 
I am not someone that gives off the air of please tell me what you think about my life choices. Mm -hmm. I don't, like, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, so I think there was some of that, but yeah. And this goes back to what I was saying before of like being really intentional about trying to not make a certain hobby, like my be all end all everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a podcast, I had been doing like different forms of writing and community building and stuff, like you said, online for quite a long time before even getting into backpacking. It was just like something that I was trying for for me that I decided to share stories about, but ha yeah, having other things that existed outside of that were really helpful. Like I've had some private conversations with friends who, um, whose profession or as a little bit more the capital H hiker, right? Like really relying on sponsorships or kind of like social media influencing. And some of those conversations have been around, um, you know, one in particular, a hike that she 100% would have quit if it mm. wasn't like a paycheck type mm -hmm. of thing, right? If there wasn't like a sponsor involved. And also that's that's how it is sometimes, right? We do what we have to do to like make money or do whatever. So I'm not, I'm certainly not gonna say that she made the wrong choice, but I don't ever wanna be in that position with my hobbies. Yeah. Like I, I am choosing long distance hiking as something to do for me because I love it. And at such point, if and when that changes, then I'll just do something else. Yeah, well said. And I, I, I hate to beat a dead horse, but one more thing on the subject of quitting. I'm curious to get your take. Do you think you were able to quit so gracefully? Is the foundation for that because you are such a confident person? Like you weren't looking to define yourself as a through hiker. You had built this foundation of you being successful in other aspects of life that it gave you permission to fail at this thing. I've never really thought about it. I think anything that I say in response is sort of like conjecture, right? Like, I don't know that I had it that well thought out. Like, hmm, why was I able to quit this thing? But yeah, I think my experience of having running be my like whole identity in a lot of different ways. And then the fallout from that was really damaging and um, humbling and a great teacher to not do that again. Mm -hmm. So I think that I had built up my life to the point where I had friends with whom we shared lots of different hobbies. I had built at that point a business that wasn't reliant on a particular activity. So I purposefully, you know, after 2015, diversified my life. Like I don't want to have, you know, I thought about this a lot after I quit drinking. I definitely lost friends, not all of them, you know, I kept some friends too, but there were friends who like, they were my drinking friends mm -hmm. and my entire social life revolved around drinking pretty much at that point. And when you stop doing the thing that you have in common with everyone, oh, you need new friends. And so, you know, over those years was a really intentional, I don't want the, all the eggs in one basket feel. And so I think that that made me, it made me feel more supported in being able to walk away from a thing because I hadn't put that thing on such a pedestal, yeah. you know? Like I had already been such a public party girl and then quit drinking. I had been like so into running and like kind of being vegan and that kind of thing and then wasn't anymore. And like, it just, I had, I had done it. I think that one of the through lives of my life and work is change and I'm relatively comfortable with change mm -hmm. or at least willing to do it. Yeah, Like I'm, I'm willing to break my own heart in order to become like the next version of myself, if that's what has to happen, sure. which doesn't mean it isn't like fucking agonizing. Right. And yeah, I think that quitting the PCT was just another example of that for me. Yeah. So you had the background of quitting or failing or the metamorphosis in the long term being a healthy evolution. And you knew that you had to do the hard thing that was going to be the right thing in the long term. Uh, there are so many subjects I want to get on, but I'm confused. I'm like conflicted into which direction I want to talk about. Cause you mentioned a couple times recently, the, uh, experience of hiking sober. So you recently had your 10 year anniversary. How much did you encounter the party atmosphere as a Southbound hiker? And, um, how challenging was that? Uh, very little, I mean, very little compared. So in 2019, I did, um, Camp Oda Kennedy Meadows South. And it was much more prevalent in that like kind of bubble or that group than it was going Sobo, hmm. um, which I expected, you mm -hmm. know, that is what I had heard from other people. So it was honestly fine. I mean, I got, I think too, maybe I just got lucky, but I felt like the Sobo crowd skewed older. And again, hmm. I, my experience is I had one experience in 2018 and one experience in 2019. And like, you just know the people that you hike around. So right. I'm not saying that this is true for everyone, but it was, almost everyone that I was hiking with was also like in their 
30s. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there was just less of like this, like very bro -y party vibe. And mm -hmm. also I was never looking for that. So I think you sort of attract what it is that you're looking for. And at that point I was, I felt very like comfortable and established in my sobriety. So it wasn't really a struggle for me. There were a couple times, like a little bit deeper into the trail where, um, I made different choices and the people I was hiking with, you know, they were all going to go into town because it was someone's birthday and it was going to be this like very boozy thing mm -hmm. that I just didn't go into town. Right. So there were a couple of times where I made the choices of, yeah, I don't really feel like doing this. Um, I don't love being around like a big group of drunk people. Like it's fine. I can you know, not in a way where I'm worried for my sobriety. I feel really strong in that. I just don't think it's that fun. Yeah. Honestly. They're annoying. Drunk people are annoying. Yeah. It's and so there were a couple of times where I did my own thing because of that. But I had it been year one of after quitting drinking, I think I would have had a hard time. Mm -hmm. So I think partially it was just, you know, I quit drinking in 2011. So we're talking 2018 at that point and had done like had done a lot of therapy, had done a lot of the you know work. So just kind of being conscious of it was enough for me. So then based on that answer, potentially you're not the right person to ask, but I'm going to ask anyways, somebody, a lot of people, I think use the trail as a venue to replace sobriety, similar to what you just described with running. Do you have any advice for them for tips to stay on track? I am not a big fan of giving advice in general <laughs> because I think that, and that's like a hot, I used to love giving advice. Like I, <laughs> like I have a lot of opinions. Let me tell you what to do with your life. Right. And that has been a big point of growth for me of realizing like, oh, wow, just because something works for me does not at all mean that it's going to work for somebody else. Yeah. So I, especially with something as individual and like tender as sobriety, like I don't know anyone else's story, right? Like if this is a, they're really regularly going to 12 step meetings and are instead going to choose to through hike. Like I think that person's experience is going to be really different from mine because that wasn't my path. Yeah. Um, I think, I guess, broad based things that work for me, not necessarily advice, but think, think about it in advance, the way that you would prepare for other things, right? Like I did a lot of gear research it also made sense to be like, okay, this is gonna be a more social hike. What do I need in order to take care of myself in this way? It's the same way of, you know, I have a reoccurring like hip glute thing that like, flare, not an injury necessarily, but like a thing that flares up. So it's like, I'm doing PT for it. I'm aware of like what sort of the mileage cap is and that's gonna feel bad. For me personally, I sort of think of sobriety the same way of like, what are the things that I need to do that keep me on the right side of okay yeah. in this regard? And those things are gonna be different for everyone. But I think for me, I don't like to just assume it's gonna be fine. You know, yeah. spending a little bit of time preparing for that the same way that like when I was vegan, I did more resupply like boxes and prep than now not being vegan. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think like anything else, depending upon where someone is in their journey with managing anything, you know, if it's chronic illness, if it's sobriety, if it's their mental health, right, whatever it is that you need to be OK, I think um, give yourself that gift and be aware that, again, like especially if it's an unfamiliar situation, like I didn't know how I was gonna be as a sober hiker because I had never been a hiker before. I had been a sober person, but I had never been a hiker. And so going into it being like, I give myself permission to do exactly what I need to do for me, even if that means separating from a group or doing something different, like put like understanding what your top priority is, I think, and being willing to like not shy away from giving yourself what it is that you need. And for me, this has nothing to do with sobriety, but I mentioned that like, I'm not a great sleeper. I pretty much get a hotel room. And obviously this is like more expensive to do this in like almost every town, because that is the, like, that's when I'm like, I know you can't catch up on sleep, but sort of mm -hmm. that. And I don't want to share a hotel room with six other people. Like I want to be in bed. I want to like take a sleeping pill, be in bed, sleep for 10 hours. And that like lets me get back on trail. And I had a lot of shame imposter syndrome around that of like what's wrong with me that everyone else seems to be able to just like pile 10 people into a room or like stay at the hostel and like be up late at night and then like just pass out and sleep fine like i'm different i am more needy i guess than that and a real turning point for me as a hiker and this really happened in 2018 was i just allow myself to meet my needs like i don't i don't it, it is fine if other people are less needy than me yeah, I, I think that's a really good thing. And it's important for people to hear is because there definitely is this mold of what a long distance backpacker is, especially AT, PCT, the popular trails that, yeah, ramen, piling bodies, this, that, and the other. But, you know, we all, we are all different, have different needs. And if you can afford to do the hotel thing, like by all means, to your point, 
I think everybody's going to sleep better in a king size bed without random noises throughout the night and like having to worry if a cockroach is going to crawl into your mouth or something like that. If you've got the means to do that, please, please do that. And maybe something to consider in terms of like how you're budgeting for a long distance. Backpack it, exactly. Or, that's, that's it. Because I think, you know, I have had people say to me before, like, oh, must be nice that you have the money to do that, which like, I think that's sort of a flippant response because yeah. in order for me to like, no one's making us through hike. No one's making us go out and do this. So for me, in order to have a good experience, I need to just maybe hike less often and save up more money in between. Yeah. Because I know that I need to have a cushion to, I mean, I'm hopeful that going out on the Colorado trail this year, this will be the lowest emotional base weight that I have ever <laughs> had on a trail, right? And the, the only time that I've gone out on a hike where I don't feel guilty that I'm leaving someone behind, right? A lot has changed in my life since I, you know, first got off trail two years or last got off trail two years ago. And so my naive hope is that that will lead to sleeping better. You know, uh, we'll report back. We'll let you know. Yeah. But I, so I have saved up more money for uh -huh. my hike. That same thing with all the foot problems. Like I know people who can put like five to 700 plus miles on their shoes. I need to switch shoes like every like 350 miles, yeah. honestly. And so, okay. I just need to save up more money and hike less often because that's what I need. Like, I'm not going out there to be miserable. Like, obviously you are miserable sometimes. And like my friend Lauren talks about how it's a privilege to be able to choose your suffering, mm -hmm. which like that definitely is, right? Like chosen suffering. Oh my God. But there's like degrees of miserable that I'm not willing to be. Yeah. It's, it's for funny my hobby. to say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my late grandfather who was Jewish and lived through the Holocaust could not for the life of him understand why I'd want to subject myself to something like through hiking. Like he spent a lot of energy and time trying to get away from depravity and like, I'm just throwing myself into it. Obviously very, very different scales, but yeah, I, I think that's a really good point to acknowledge the, that is a privilege. Um, I think the last subject that I want to touch on for the PCT hike is your relationship, because I think that the light bulb goes off for a lot of people. And I see this a lot, especially with somewhat new relationships in the context of through hiking, um, that they discover new things about themselves and what they want from life. And then that can be the end of long-term relationships. I'm curious, it, by your description, it didn't sound like the through hike was the reason why the relationship ended, but I'm curious to know, one, like what space did that open up for you to arrive to that being the correct decision? And if you're comfortable talking about it, like the transition with your current partner. Yeah, I'll talk about it a little bit. I'm always, um, you know, I, I am happy to talk like very openly about my experience, but want to be very careful when I'm like telling stories that also involve other people too, right? right. Like my former spouse is a much more private person than I am. And mm -hmm. so I, I try to walk that line carefully of, you know, what does and doesn't get shared out loud. And that's going back to what I said about being someone who really values and has like built their life's work around honest conversations. Honesty and privacy can definitely exist together, mm -hmm. right? And so like being aware of like, what are you willing to be honest about versus like what's private? Um, so just sort of like that disclaimer. Mm -hmm. Um, will you ask your question again? Sorry. I, yeah, it was I two questions head. and I do that a lot and I'm dumb. So let's start, <laughs> let's start with the, re the role that the through hike played in the end of your marriage. Yeah. I think that it would be an oversimplification to say that, you know, I got divorced because of long distance hiking, right? Like there's sort of like a, a tied in a bow story there. But like I said, you know, we have been having conversations around this for like seven months or so, like before I even went on the PCT, uh, for us, it was a series of things in which we weren't really well matched that if it were only one of those things, I think that we probably would have made it work. But it was a lot of just square peg round hole, right? Like we talked a little bit about the monogamy stuff before. There were just like a couple of things that on their own, I think would have been fixable if we're going to say that. But put all together, it was sort of like, but why? You know, we don't have kids. We're, you know, both childless by choice and like planning to stay that way. And, you know, a lot of our conversations, so when I got back from the PCT, a lot of our conversations in deciding, you know, are we going to get divorced or not? were really around this question of what would have to be true in order for you to be really excited to stay in this marriage. And that was sort of the question that unlocked things for us because the answer that he gave was directly like in like opposition to the answer that I gave, right? Like yeah. all the things that would have to be true for him to be like stoked to stay married to me were different than the thing, like we're like the complete opposite of things would have to be true for me. And we really thought about that of like, okay. And our situation I think is unique in that 
were incredibly close friends. Not to say that the divorce wasn't really hard, but it was more of a relationship transition. Like, can this be a friendship and like a chosen family relationship? And can we just sort of remove like the romantic and sexual aspects of it? And that was a lot of what I, circling back, Chance, to your question about monogamy that I think I inelegantly answered before, but a lot of what I learned was about how many different types of relationships there are that in sort of our normalized culture, we don't count as valid. You know, there's a reason that we say, oh, we're just friends, as if a friendship has less meaning than a romantic partnership, where like I've had friendships that have outlasted every romantic relationship I've ever had, right? And so a lot of that for me was starting to think about as a person who doesn't want kids, what does family look like? What does community look like? What are the types of relationships that I want to have? And I think that that really informed a lot of the decisions we made to sort of transition our relationship into more of a friendship as opposed to this is my ex. Like you'll never hear me use the word ex-husband, right? Like I'll never say that just because that feels like very harsh to me. And so it was... I think that the through hiking played a role in that when I graduated college, I sort of made the decision that I was done following like the path of the check boxes, right? You like get into the best school you can, you do this, you get the corporate job, you get married, you have the house. Like I was not interested in that. I've never had what I think people would call like a normal job or like I've never had like an office job. It's always been self-employment, seasonal employment, a bunch of random shit pieced together because I have always chosen the like freedom and autonomy, especially like time autonomy over some of the more like stable path things that just works for me. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. But I realized that I had chosen like partners, like life partners who were very career focused, who had two weeks of vacation a year, like by choice that they were really driven in that way. And so I had sort of given myself fake freedom. Like Mm. I could go hike for months a year, but I would be partnered or do whatever travel partnered with people who either couldn't or didn't want to. And so that was, it wasn't about long distance hiking specifically, but it was, oh, we really actually want different lives. And that didn't become apparent until it did, right? You don't know what you know whatever, like you don't know what you don't know, right? And um, so we decided that a lot of the like story that we had both been told was that you get divorced when you're absolutely miserable, right? Like the only reason that you would end a marriage is if it's like rock bottom. And I was really uncomfortable with that, that like, why does misery have to be like the price of admission for making a change? Like, what if we actually, like if, if, if the criteria for getting divorced was that we had to hate each other, we'd we'd get there eventually, but why? Mm -hmm. And so I always sort of think that we got divorced a little bit too soon in a good way. That we're like, okay, like the things that we both want aren't gonna change. The amount of sacrifices that we would both have to make to keep this relationship in its current iteration, it's not worth it. Let's try building this, let's go through the grief. Like I said, break your own heart in order to do whatever is next. And I feel profoundly grateful that when the time came to like love each other enough to let go that we decided to do that yeah and you didn't have to burn any bridges to get there no and which doesn't mean that it wasn't also awful yeah and like so heartbreaking and this was two years a little over two years ago right so like the last two years have been a lot of just like dealing with that and getting into a new relationship relatively quickly like that's also been a little bit of an adjustment Mm -hmm. um as well. Um, so yeah, it's long story short, did not get divorced because of through hiking and did not not get divorced because of through hiking. Yeah. And then the second part to the ridiculous two set of questions was, and whatever you're open to sharing, obviously, but the, I guess, transition into your current relationship, because you met uh, this gentleman on the PCT, right? Yeah, yeah, we met, we were part of the same trail family in 2018, Um, which, like I said, I was, so the first time that we met, um, he had started the day before me. And so, you know, starting from Hearts Pass, going up to the border and then turning around, right? So I was going to the border and he was coming back from the border. And I had started to see that there was some snow. We were coming up on Hopkins Pass. And like I said, I had never hiked in snow before. I was so nervous. And so I'm alone in the morning and I see this dude come in, like bounding over, whatever. I stopped him and I'm like, hey, how's the snow up ahead? He's like, oh, it's totally fine. It's no big deal. So I'm like, oh, that's a huge relief. That's fine. I get up there, you know, so he goes on his way. I go on my way. I get up there. It is not fine. <laughs> like it is, I'm terrified. It's so snowy. I'm up there. Fuck this guy. I never want to see this guy again with his terrible snow intel, right? And so that was the first time that we met. And like I said, you know, as you do, Sobo, you kind of stack up in trail towns, right? Like that you wind up being on the same path. And 
we with a couple of other people wound up in an awesome trail family, I, like an experience that I could not ever have predicted would happen. And it was really the first time that I had friends who were into this thing. And we had all, you know, we all had the, the four of us in our trail family, we all had like different careers that had made this possible. But we had all like what I was looking for was people who loved this thing enough to make whatever the sacrifices were that had to happen for this to be true in their lives. Right. And so it was such a cool point of commonality and was really helpful for me in realizing there are other people who also want this weird life that I want that care about you know, financial stability to a certain degree that love the work that they're doing, but don't want to work all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it really opened my eyes to like, oh, I can spend my life. And I don't mean this in kind of like a romantic way, but like I can spend my life surrounded by people who also want the things that I want. And that was, it sounds silly. Cause like, of course there's other people out there who want the things that you want, but if you aren't experiencing that, it can feel pretty lonely. And it was the same thing when I started making friends who like also didn't drink. I was like, Oh my God, that's it. Like I didn't know a single sober person when I quit drinking. Mm. And so being like, Ooh, friends who also threw high or want to through high. Great. Right? Um, was incredible. And we were really good friends and got off the trail and had no idea if I was ever going to see any of these people again. Like we had, that's one of the, I know you guys know, it's a weird thing. You like have this really tight bond and then you like disperse back to your corners of the country or the world. And it's like, well, you were the closest person to me. And now, yeah, bye. I like, might not even know your real name. Like. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. And um, also he's eight years younger than me, right? So like when we met on top of Hopkins Pass, like he was 25, right? So there was nothing in my brain that was like, I'm gonna date this dude someday. Like it yeah. was just not, it was not, right? And, you know, went home didn't, I mean, sort of stayed in touch with my trail family, but like not as much. I basically had to go home and like deal with my life, right? And like go through this transition, you know, with my former spouse. And um, part of deciding to get divorced, I um, wanted to give van life a try, partially because it's what I could afford. It was a hugely financial decision for me. Uh, and, um, you know, buying the van and like the expenses to build that out were sort of part of how, how we decided to split our assets, right? So I was like incredibly lucky that there was money to be able to do that. And um, uh, my current partner, uh, his trail name is Gentleman, Gent for short. It's funny, we call each other by our trail names, but so Gent is kind of like a builder, carpenter, woodworker, like by trade. And he decided to fly out and like basically help me build my van or like teach me. I'd never used power tools in my life. I'm like, I'm going to build this van. Like, what is a drill? How does hammer? Like, I didn't know anything. <laughs> and so he flew out and yeah, that was the time where I was like, there's some, there was like something here, but I was like a shell of a person, right? Like I couldn't, that was like not something that I could really think about. And so he helped me build my van, like proved to be an incredible friend to me. And we then went out that spring to do the desert section of the PCT and decided like, okay, like let's try dating. And part of me was like, eh, I just got divorced. Like this feels, I, I, I was unsure um, and wanted to give it a shot anyway. And I feel like he knew what he was getting into in terms of like what my, what my mental health was at that time and like what I could and couldn't give um, was really patient with me and that was some years ago. So, so far, so far, so good, but certainly wasn't without its um, sort of communication and like a lot of conversations around what does it mean to like get out of one relationship and into another relationship so quickly. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna do something strange here. I'm actually gonna end the podcast, not because I'm worried about it going long, but because I wanna leave enough subject matter for when you come back to Colorado so we can get you on for a second time. When is sure. the Colorado Trail? Before you when? Go. Yeah, when are you doing it? August. Okay, cool. I just wanted to know. That was uh, so abrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we're going to make it happen. Uh, when you're back out here, you'll be sitting right there, you know, assuming that the world's not on fire. Um, and we'll get to these other subjects that I've got highlighted here. But, Nicole, always great to see you and talk to you. Um, very excited for your upcoming trek. Thanks for your time. Please let Backpacker Radio listeners know where they should go to keep up with your upcoming trips. Mm. Well, my like newly raised to the ground Instagram is probably a good place. Uh, I am, uh, what's my Instagram? Nick.Antoinette, I think, yeah. Nick.Antoinette on Instagram. Does not even know her own Instagram. <laughs> but yes, It'll be in the that, show notes. That seems like a good place. Cool, cool. Well, great chatting with you. Thanks for your time and can't wait for round two. You are so welcome. I hope that was at all intelligible. It was <laughs> very, very <fun>. intelligible. <laughs> <laughs>